Gin 25, uh, the name was basically just a placeholder. As I was formulating the gin, I realized that I'd been in the business for 25 years and was uh, kind of kind of looking back at that long career and how much I'd learned. And you always have a placeholder for a new recipe for something just to differentiate it from something else. And usually you come up with a better name in the meantime and that just didn't happen. I just thought it was a nice, simple name. And 25 years is an awful long time to be in this business. And so it stuck. Gin 25, you know, really re revolves around kind of starting with two ingredients that I fell in love with, and that's uh, green mandarin and red mandarin. And as most of you know, we distill each one of the botanicals individually here when we're making a gin. So I was just running through the ingredients that, that we might potentially use. I was looking at the two, two ingredients, so green mandarin, it's basically the same orange botanically. Green just simply means that you're harvesting it when it's young. And when it's young, it has those savory flavors that so many people associate with cooking. So many of the world's cuisines use green mandarin, and it has kind of a nice savory, spicy note to the orange uh, that just makes it appetizing and fit with so many dishes. Red mandarin is simply the same plant allowed to grow to complete maturity on the tree. And when it drifts into that red territory, the flesh turns into a deeper red. And the flavors and aromas are very similar to a tangerine. And as I was trying to decide between the two botanicals, I realized that they played very well together. So I decided to use both of them. And as you're sipping on the gin, it alternates between the two flavors. So by the time you figure out whether it's the savoriness of the green mandarins or it's the tangerine qualities of the red mandarin, your cocktail's done and it's time for another one. So that's when I decided, okay, we have a winner here using the two of them. From there, we're adding some savory notes. The one I'm probably proudest of is the use of white pepper. The white pepper that we get comes from Sri Lanka. And I would describe it as a single note that goes through the aroma, the mid palate and the finish. And it's very unusual for, for a botanical to behave like that. Like you're hitting a piano note and it goes through the entire gin. And it's just a wonderful counterpoint to, this, to the uh, savoriness of that uh, green mandarin and the citrus strength that you get from the red. This goes perfectly. Roy Boss tea is a tea many people are familiar with. It lends a lovely red color to teas. It's just very robust, kind of earthy, savory note in the tea. Now, of course, color doesn't transfer over during distillation, so that's irrelevant to my purposes. But where the Roy Boss tea shows up is in the finish. It just gives a bit of depth and a little bit of elegance to the gin. And it, that's something that it needed and it filled that hole perfectly. Juniper, of course, goes into all gins by law. The juniper that we get comes from Bulgaria. And the nature of the way that we distill by cutting out the portions that I don't particularly care for really helps brighten the flavor. So in other words, with juniper, a lot of people who say they don't care for gin, normally what they tell me is it tastes like pine needles or Christmas. What they're trying to convey is a compound in juniper called pinene, and pinene is something that shows up later in the boil. So in other words, you put the juniper in the still and you add the spirit and bring it to a boil. The oils and the flavors from the juniper vaporize, condense and come out as distillate with the flavors and aromas of the juniper. Well, as you let that boil run longer and longer, 
you're starting to get into what I would call tails, and so it's really the very end when you should stop collecting that distillate. And nearing the end of the, normally where you would find the hearts is where that pinene starts to get concentrated, and pinene is the chemical component in juniper. So what we do is we move the cut up so that we're excluding that pine flavor, and it makes juniper berry taste like more like a, a berry. So brighter, more of a fruit, more effervescent, and bright flavors. Orris root is a very common ingredient in gin, and the reason is it has a very striking earthy note to it that to my palate and, and nose, it, it, it's a bit like vanilla almost. It's a vanilla earthy aroma and flavor. And the way I look at it, it's, it's a foundational botanical in the sense that you may not necessarily notice that it's there, but if you take it out, the gin falls apart. So it has a way of holding up the rest of the botanicals in the gin, you know, almost like a canvas and it's been used in gins for hundreds of years. It's the root of the iris flower, many people don't know that. And it just has a, a delightful note that I came across. Re really, it was the first time I distilled a botanical that wasn't used in food, right? So things like oranges and, and mandarin oranges and white pepper, obviously, are things that you cook with, so you're used to them. Orris root was the first botanical I work with. It's really designed for distilling more than anything else, and also perfumes and some other things like that. And the first time I, I put it in the still, it was very much an aha moment of, but boy, do I like this aroma. Uh, and, and, and as a result, it's in a number of our gins here at Leopold Brothers. The traditional way of making gin is to fill the still with spirit and put all the botanicals in at once. So, for example, juniper, cardamom, coriander, uh, lemon peel. You're gonna add the spirit to the still and you're going to bring it to a boil and the vapor that comes off of that still up over to the condenser it's going to have the flavors and aromas of the lemon and the juniper, you get the idea. At that point, it's called perfume spirit. And that's the base for your gin, essentially. You can cut it with water, you can add more alcohol, you can do whatever it is you want to do to finish the gin. The problem with that is that each one of those botanicals has a different boiling point. So in other words, the oil that's in the juniper, the oil that's in the lemon peel, really has a different sweet spot. And by boiling them all together, you're basically trying to find a happy medium. And the analogy I like to use for that is that it's a bit like trying to cook a steak on a skillet together with potatoes and uh, sausage and eggs all at once at the same temperature for the same length of time. Now, obviously that's not gonna be a ve very palatable skillet. Uh, although it does have sausage, so, you know, that's not a horrible thing. But you, you're not getting the best out of each ingredient. So the way I decided to get around that is to distill each botanical on its own, what people would call today fractional distillation. So that means that I would fill the still with spirit and put the juniper in and bring it to a boil, just like you would adding all the ingredients together, except for now I have a lot more control over the aromas and flavors I can get out of that juniper. I have complete control over what happens in that still. So in other words, I can change the concentration of the alcohol in the still. So put it in at 20% alcohol or 40% alcohol is gonna completely change the characteristic of the flavors and aromas I get out of that juniper berry. So think about what that does to my gin production. I, I'm really getting the very best out of each one of the botanicals. And the way that we accomplish that is we fill the still with some neutral spirit, essentially what people would consider to be vodka. 
and we're going to add a, a botanical in, so say several kilograms of juniper. We're going to close the manway door and apply the steam to the outside of that pot to warm it up to a boil. So it's going to start to come to a boil, and what's going to come out are the aromas and oils that are hidden in that juniper berry are going to come and work its way to the top of the line arm and over into the condenser and come out as alcohol. But those heads you have to set aside, and, and what you're looking for is clarity. And so the, this is what many people call the demisting test. And what that means is you're taking a sample of the distillate, and you're adding water. Most people will cut it in half to make sure that as you add that water, the oils don't come out of solution. And once that distillate runs clear, that tells you, okay, now I'm in my hearts. And this is where you're looking for the best possible flavor out of, again, as we're talking here, juniper. The flavors are bright, they're clean, they're crisp. And for me, the cut that I'm making is basically saying, okay, when I don't like these flavors anymore, I'm going to make a cut, and from there in, that's called tails. That, that's going to be discarded as well, and I'm just going to keep the heart the essence, the very best of the flavor and aroma that, that I can capture out of that ingredient. When I have that heart, I'll set it aside in a nice carboy and, and let that rest. And I'll empty the still out and then we'll put some orris root into the still and repeat the entire process. So what's happening is these cuts are allowing us to discard flavors and aromas that I don't find to be appealing. And that, that cut line allows me to choose a different cut for each botanical that we put in. So some cuts are quite high, as is in the case of the juniper berry. And some can run a little bit longer, as we do for the orris root, because it has you know, more of the earthy tones that I'm looking for a little bit later in that run. So when we're talking about distilling that juniper all by itself, now I can make that head and tail cut exactly where I want it. In the case of juniper, being able to land where my tail cut is makes an enormous difference in the quality of the gin. And what I've learned in my career is with people who tell me I just simply don't like gin, usually that is followed by it tastes like pine needles or it tastes like Christmas. What they're describing is a compound called pinene that you find in juniper. But the piney doesn't show up until later in the run where you're pushing into that cut. So when I'm distilling juniper, I'm able to move that cut up to the point where that piney really doesn't show up hardly at all. And what you're tasting is, is really more like a berry. The, the juniper, the, the flavor's much brighter. It's not as savory. It's much more of a fruit note to it. And it makes the, the gins that we make here almost effervescent. Cuts for the orris root are going to be entirely different from where they would be for the juniper. So again, I get, I get the best flavors and the exact aromas that I'm looking for out of that botanical. And each one of these distillates are set aside. And then when I'm ready to make the gin, we put them into a mixing tank, stir and add a bit of water slowly over time. The water used for gin, in case you were curious, you always need to add demineralized water. So in other words, it has to go some, through some type of filtration where you're removing calcium and magnesium and other what you'd call salts in our industry anyway. Because if you don't do that and you add the alcohol to it, you'll have a perfectly clear uh, bottle of gin leaving your plant. But over time, those salts are actually gonna fall out of solution and look like little snowflakes at the bottom of a bottle. People don't particularly care for that. So everybody uses at least deionized water to proof their spirit down. So as we're slowly adding this water and proofing it down to 47%, I'm tasting and nosing it as, as I go. And I'm altering how much of the juniper and the rest of the ingredients we put in our gins just based on experience and what I'm looking for to try and make the most consistent and brightest gin we can.